Okay, Father Cox. The report. Sorry. That recording. Well, uh, good morning and good morning to our uh, viewers on our Zoom or whatever we want to call it. And you are most welcome to uh, be part of our program here today. I hope you can see me all right. Some people say that that would be um, better if you, if you can't see me uh, that well, you know, but that's a different story. <clears throat> what we're doing <clears throat> today is moving uh, through uh, the chapters of scripture in Second Corinthians, and we're going to have some commentary on an article, but also some commentary just on what we think about Paul at this stage of the game. So I want to take the text first, and then I will move into the... I, I did uh, have something that was helpful to very people of various ethnic backgrounds because a lot of people would like to think that Jesus was one of them. For example, uh, here are three proofs that Jesus was Jewish. He went into his father's business. He lived at home until he was 33. He was sure his mother was a virgin and his mother was sure he was God. <laughs> that's, that's the Jewish kind of thing. My doctor is Jewish and uh, I told you the story before about the Protestant, the Catholic, and the Jewish mothers all sitting around and saying, when do you think life begins? And the Protestant said, well, at the time when the, the, uh, you can see the movement of hands and feet in the womb. The, the mother, uh, the Catholic mother says, when the child is conceived. The Jewish mother says, when he gets his doctoral degree. <laughs> so uh, anyway, three proofs that Jesus was Irish. He never got married. He was always telling stories. He loved green pastures. <clears throat> Report proofs that uh, Jesus was Puerto Rican. His first name was Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> he was bilingual. He was always being harassed by the authority. Three proofs that Jesus was Italian. He talked with his hands. He had wine with every meal. He worked in the building trades. <laughs> Three proofs that Jesus was a Californian. He never cut his hair. He walked around barefoot and he started a new religion. <laughs> Three proofs that Jesus was a woman. He had to feed a crowd at a moment's notice when there was no food. He tried, he, he kept trying to get a message across to a bunch of men who just didn't get it. Even when he was dead, he had to get up, get, get up because there was still some more work to do. Yeah, there you go. Now, as you can see, uh, what we have done is uh, taken uh, parallel chapters here of the Second Corinthians. It's a shorter uh, text and a more emotional text because it's, it comes that uh, we get more of a sense of Paul's, mm, you know, emotion about, you know, should I do this or not? You get kind of into his soul a little bit. And I'll talk about that in a, when we get done with our first uh, uh, analysis, which will be chapter three. You can see chapter three and chapter four are very short, brief. And uh, so, but that's our work for today because we've got this all measured out. And uh, one of the things that occurs in this second letter is that we get a sense that Paul is thinking these things through. Uh, I, you know, we, we have uh, this terrible set of earthquakes in Turkey, uh, which was Christian territory you know at the time of Paul and uh in the middle of eastern Turkey were the cities that he visited uh, in uh, uh, Antioch of Pisidia uh, Iconium uh, uh, and uh, several others including uh um, Derbe and Lystra and so he visited those towns the one town they they thought they had killed him and, and dragged his body out of the city but, but he did live and they found him in the ditch in the morning. And uh, so Paul uh, then on a second missionary journey goes back through this. Now that would be the area where this, these uh, earthquakes have been taking place in the southeastern part of Turkey uh, into Syria, which uh, is part of their border. And so those are uh, terrible, terrible uh, events. Um, and uh, the number that they have now is 43,000 people killed. Could you imagine if the west side of 
of uh, Chicago, of the suburbs that are out here, you know, each having 20,000 or so, what, you know, and having them just wiped out, uh, that uh, would be a horrible thing. There are seven wonders of the ancient world. All of them were destroyed, except for the pyramids. And the reason why that they were uh, all uh, destroyed is for most of them, earthquakes. So you had the great temple of Zeus with a monstrous statue in it and a, a walkway to go up into it. And uh, there is a, a form of this, by the way, in Berlin, because when they uh, gave the right for the German archeologists back in the early 1900s to go into Pergamon, which is a city in, uh, uh, right along the coastline of uh, Turkey. And it'd be, that's called Asia Minor. And so they, uh, they said, take whatever you want. Well, you'd think, well, well they maybe, maybe take a horse or two or something like that. No, they took the whole temple. They marked out each brick and each block, and they shipped it up all the way around and uh, brought it into Berlin. And uh, it was in the days of the, of the Russian control of that segment of uh, Berlin. Uh, you, you had to you know, go and, and walk through a kind of, kind of a examination section first to see you know, whether you can walk into Eastern Germany, uh, East, the Eastern Germany part of uh, Berlin. Uh, but anyway, that's where the temple was. And uh, so uh, wanting to see it, I was invited, I think I've told you this before, by the German State Department back in 1984 uh, to talk to, uh, along with other American educators, there was a small group of us, about uh, 15. Uh, most of them were uh, upper level people, uh, but they wanted to have some schlunk who was working in the trenches. <laughs> so yeah, there I was. <laughs> and uh, so they took us to Bonn, Stuttgart, Munich in Berlin. When we got to Berlin, they said, well, this would be a nice thing to do is to go to East Berlin. So uh, our guide who was, uh, uh, attache of the uh, Berlin uh, landscape of, um, of the people of the uh, country, uh, you know, coming to, uh, to, to go into another country, because that's how it worked this way. And, oh, it was a terrible thing. You, you come up to the window and, and uh, you have to hold up your thing and, and the, they just stare at you. As I'm serious, for about three or four minutes, they just stare at you with a grimace. And then they kind of Save you know to something like that, but then we we got out and then we got soldiers behind us with rifles. But anyway, we go over there and we we went into the museum. It, it was fascinating. Uh, you got to walk up to all these things. So what I'm talking about is that the uh, uh, earthquakes have destroyed that great temple of Zeus that was in Greece, not the one at Pergamon. So uh, also the uh, uh, mausoleum of uh, Helicarnassus, which was the uh, man who uh, built this whole. Uh, uh, large, uh, many acre, about 80 acres of buildings and stuff like that because of his wife who had died. And uh, so uh, there was a, so he built a temple there and that was destroyed. Uh, the uh, gardens of Babylon, they were destroyed, you know, several levels up of stories and stuff like that, probably about maybe uh, five or 10 stories tall uh, above everything else. And uh, you can see some of the things that the uh, Germans have, have uh, brought in from that. Uh, they had these great big uh, um, kind of porcelain hallways, uh, like a big street. And they had giant lions and giant soldiers and other type things that you could walk through them. So they saved some of those too. Uh, the uh, Colossus at Rhodes, uh, which was a great big huge statue at the, at the beginning of the uh, area of the uh, uh, disembarking of the ships and things like that was this great big huge statue. The library at Alexandria got burnt. Uh, the pyramids were okay. And so those were the type things that, that happened, but the rest of them were just destroyed by earthquakes. Uh, I mentioned that because of the fact that it comes uh, somewhat into our purview that, it, 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 the, uh, that the Middle East was not like a beach. It wasn't like Florida or something like that, you know, where, although they had all of that, but still there was a, a whole series of uh, things that can happen uh, because of the platelets that are underneath that part of the globe. So um, what um, we're talking about is uh, in this uh, uh, letter of Paul, we, we have, a, and I, I can't get into it sadly, uh, <clears throat> but we have in the, in the whole letter, you have a section and there's small sections like two or three verses. And one was letter A, then a couple of lines later, a letter B, 
and then a letter C. Am I making sense? You know, and that would be a couple of sentences. Letter D and E. And uh, those were actually words that came into Paul's letter from his other writings or from uh, someone later on adding to the, uh, what Paul's thought was because he was with Paul, but Paul didn't have his scribe write it down. And uh, also because of the fact that paper was very expensive. And so sometimes when they had one letter going, they might jam in other type things. So if I'm making any sense to you, we have the letter, the second letter of Corinth to, to Corinth, but in that letter, we have segments, A, B, C, D, and E. So today, uh, I can't point them out to you, but we have like C and D. Well, there are only one or two sentences. So I don't think, you know, that there's big blocks of material, but it just does mean that there's some uh, other attrition of, of people bringing their thoughts and stuff like that into Paul's letter. And other people remember being with Paul. Um, this is a, an attraction to me uh, only because of the fact that on one day and part of my journey through the seven uh, towns of the uh, <clears throat> of, of Revelation, the seven cities of the Revelation, Pergamon was one of them. Uh, but there was on the, on the west side, as you're going up uh, through uh, uh, Turkey, what, what you're getting are roads that were built by the Romans. Uh, and the Romans brought peace to the Mideast and they also brought roads. And that made for commerce, made it for exchange, for people to go back and forth to cities and stuff like that. You didn't have to walk. Uh, you know, people are looking at these uh, movies now that are about Jesus. I was talking with some people the other night. I don't know if you've seen any of those movies that are out, you know, that are on Jesus. Uh, but, but one of the things that's interesting to them is, oh, I, I said, uh, this one person said, oh, I like it that they walked everywhere. <laughs> you know, that there was, you know, okay. Uh, you know, well, we might have electric cars soon, so who knows? But but they uh, they walked everywhere, and in, in doing so, uh, they uh, were able uh, to uh, have kind of like the slow pace. Now, the average distance that you could walk, you know, they say, in those days, was twenty miles a day without worry. In other words, you you're sturdy enough to do it, so it was not a problem. Um, when I was much younger, uh, like right after the Civil War, um, the um, uh, I belonged to the Boy Scouts in Joliet, and uh, we had practically every hike that you took was always 20 miles. And, uh, you know, they're up in Rockford, you walked along the, the river there, then you walked up on the top, uh, down in Springfield, you walked through, you know, from outside the city into the city. Uh, you went down at Morris, you went out there and, and came back and stuff. So everything was 20. Then when I got to college up in Canada, sure enough, they did the same thing, you know, but we didn't get a badge for it, you know. Um, uh, it was, uh, you know, the, every Saturday they would uh, kind of like release the uh, college uh, students uh, for the Mount Carmel College, you know, for pe people studying for the, the priesthood. And uh, and you would you would leave Niagara Falls and you would walk all the way out to Niagara on the lake, which was a kind of a, a town that had a lot of uh, uh, film and uh, plays and other type things. So people would flock to that. And then they would send a bus out there to pick us up and bring us back. So uh, anyway, that was a full day. But uh, one of the things that happened when, as you're walking along, because there were like 60 of us in our, uh, more than that in our program at that time, uh, and, and we were all walking together. So you pick out some friends or people you don't know, or you just, you know, go at their pace and you start sharing thoughts and everything like that. And uh, so you really, it was really kind of a building of a community about your walking. Well, that's what happened with this situation here too. There's, uh, Paul's not taking a train, or uh, thank goodness, or uh, or uh, some other kind of vehicle. He's not taking a coach because he couldn't afford that, and so uh, and uh, he had no need for that because he's going to stay at people's places and, and things. And uh, so, what uh, in in my journey there, that we after we got out of Pergamon, we uh, they we they dropped us off, and we started to walk, and we walked on a Roman road. Now, at this time, it wasn't a smooth road because, in fact, that would have been filled in with uh, dirt and some other things like that. But it was rounded uh, stone. And some of the stones had, <laughs> had line, <laughs> lines in them where the wheels would go. But as we started to walk along, there were seven of us from the Biblical Archaeology Society. And so we started talking and about various things, not about ourselves, but about, you know, what we're experiencing with uh, how Paul would have done this. And uh, the... Uh, I just want to check something. Keep talking. Am I okay. You're good. Did you hear that? I'm good. <laughs> Dear diary, <laughs> you wouldn't believe what they said about me today.
So what I'm, I'm thinking of uh, our experience of just walking, I don't know, we walked on that day in Turkey, we walked maybe three miles or so, but it was on the road that Paul walked on. So you had a little bit of a mystical experience because you're walking on places, you know, they say if you go on one of these trips to uh, Israel and you walk where Jesus walked, well, here's a place where Paul walked. But, but you could tell exactly what was going on in those walks. It wasn't a series of lone birds. They were all together into a flock and they would be talking back and forth. They would even resounding thoughts about, well, what do you think about this? Or uh, how about this? They, and there might even, in that sense, have a challenge of a debate or a conversation that would lead them into a further understanding. And of course, Paul was always a, a, a central figure in that because of the fact at one time, he tells us in his letters that he was taken up into heaven. We found that in the Acts of the Apostles, he was taken up into heaven and he couldn't uh, express the beauty of what he saw because it was beyond words. And so what Paul is doing is he's kind of like lighting a fire of knowledge and insight and spirituality as he walks along. And when you're walking like that, you're not running or hustling. You don't need that. Uh, what you're doing is it's, it's a nice summer day or whatever. And uh, so when these letters come out, they, they're kind of a distillation of a lot of things that go on to build them up to begin with. So let's uh, start to read for today. What we're going to do is take chapter three, then we'll take our uh, we, I do have a little meditation for you, and then we'll do chapter four. So here we are in uh, Corinthians. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? See, uh, but this is the poetry that Paul brings into this. He says, do we need to write a letter to you <laughs> to tell you that we are authentic? No, he says, you people at Corinth are our letter to the world. Isn't this wonderful to hear after you heard in that first letter of chapters one to four, where he's slapping them around for their lack of uh, integrity, and then five, six, and seven, stuff like going on, even to how they uh, didn't uh, celebrate the Eucharist, right? And so he's, he, you know, and this, we've already talked about the fact that now the question is going to be, is he, does he want to go back there and seem to be domineering again? Or does he want to write them a letter? He said, but you people out there in Corinth, he just has this praise for them. You see, uh, we, we have to think of this because when you when you think, you know, if a Paul starts out in his letter, uh, 1 Corinthians, and he has, has bombastic attitudes, uh, that that's awkward. Uh, then to say, uh, now I'm going to come and see you again. Oh, no, he's going to go after us. So what, he, what he's doing is he's giving uh, this uh, metaphor that you, the people of Corinth, are a holy group, a converted group, a people in love with Christ. You could be a Jewish convert. You could be a Gentile convert. Uh, you could be a person of some wealth or uh, position, or you could be a person who is a farmer. Some 90 plus percent of the world at that time were farmers, agricultural people. Uh, so even though they had large cities, they, they, they certainly needed food and uh, meals and things. He says, you are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by all. So what he's telling the people of Corinth who are valid, uh, that they are giving Paul recognition. Uh, I, you just have to uh, put yourself into the mindset of Paul now. He says, you are our letter written on our hearts. In other words, you, the people of Corinth that we were, you know, discussing with some negativity before have now developed to the point where you actually are coming out to the leader of the church. You say, well, wait a minute, Peter, you know, is the leader of the church. We're talking about the evangelical church. The evangelical church is the church that is out there preaching and teaching and then moving on to another place and another place and another place. So you do have uh, the apostles spreading out. Mark is going down to northern Part of Africa. You got Thomas by tradition is going off over to India. Uh, you get the others. Uh, some are going up into what we would call uh, Croatia, Yugoslavia. So the uh, uh, and uh, one after another, they are being uh, themselves executed. Uh, practically uh, everyone except uh, John. The tradition is where, although we do not have uh, an, an actual genuine proof on that, that Mark or some of these others were all executed. We don't, we don't have that written down. Some of them, we do have instances of how they're doing it, whether they were skinned or whether they were boiled or other type of 
travesties of putting people to death. So it, we, uh, but uh, we don't have a clear knowledge of it. So you don't have a book of the death of, or the martyrdom of all the apostles, but you do have it by tradition that comes down through the uh, centuries after that, that this is what has happened to them. So I, I just see, I put down there, magnificent, known and read by all. Shown to be a letter of Christ, administered by us, written not in ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets that are hearts of flesh. This is poetry at its best. This is Paul at its best. Because when he says tablets of stone, what's he thinking about, obviously, is the commandments. You know, God scratching out the commandments, the Ten Commandments, and giving to you. He says, no, no. He says, we, we don't have that. Uh, and he's not denigrating that, but he's just saying, no, what you have given is something even more significant because you are reaching into our hearts. The, the, the uh, mindset of the uh, intellectual life in uh, the Mediterranean at that time was twofold. Uh, one was uh, the great Platonists from three to 400 before Christ. So you have Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and each one of them a magnificent uh, a, uh, display of uh, philosophy. Uh, Augustine, for example, takes Plato and works on Plato. Thomas Aquinas takes uh, the uh, Aristotle work, which is more scientific and logical. And he, he makes his uh, work, Thomas Aquinas uh, work on God as saying that there is a cause for everything. In other words, you cannot come to this world, this life, this cosmos, this uh, humanity, uh, this way of, of living. You cannot have any of that unless there was a cause. You cannot have an effect that is uh, uh, without cause. So uh, you cannot just come up with an, an effect that'd be like a miracle all of a sudden. So the people who want to say that the uh, whole of the universe came about as God's creation in seven years or something, uh, well, that would have to be a flash miracle, whereas the scientists would tell you, no, it took billions of years. What was the anticipation of the uh, life-giving forces uh, coalescing now into an uh, animal-like uh, events? That would be 4.4 billion years before Christ. And then when you get to about 380 billion years before Christ, that you start to get humanity, including our own continent that we're on right now. So you're saying to yourself, a, a billion years? How, how long does that take? Well, that takes that long to, to move from nothingness to something and uh, to use protein th type things and stuff like that. And all of a sudden to develop things that are mobile. So this, this is a kind of a background to it because what uh, is happening is the, the scientific uh, view of the philosophy at the time was all under Greek uh, origin. And they said that it was the mind that causes you to be the person. So it's your brain and your thinking is what makes you to be a person. Now, but the, uh, that's the, uh, the kind of the, the route of the, the Greeks, the route of the uh, uh, people of, of um, the Jewish background uh, are uh, people of the heart. So the heart is where the center of your being is. That is why it is so much of an icon for us in, in many of the ways that these things are developing. So anyway, uh, when he talks about hearts of flesh, he's talking about our very humanity. So I'm on verse four. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that of ourselves we are qualified to take credit for anything. That's to see all this is the truth, is it not? It's not like Paul saying, yeah, well, we brought this about. You know, we were those who did it. Um, rather, our qualification comes from God. There was a movie some 30, 40 years ago about uh, a father saying goodbye to his son who's going to go off to fight in the Civil War. And uh, anyway, so they have a big meal of the family. So the father starts to give the grace. He says, we thank God because we did everything. <laughs> We, we put together the farm. We put together the war. We put together this. We put together that. We did this. We did that. So God is kind of like he, he left, you know, right after the first phrase, he went out to the barn. And uh, but see, so that was the thing. There is a, a, a new kind of understanding that's coming out uh, in these next couple of weeks uh, that where they're going to be discussing the early church. And uh, the radio today was saying one of the things they're going to do 
is to emphasize the Protestants' uh, rebellion against the church. And I don't use that in a harsh way. I'm just saying that um, uh, should have continued what happened in the early church is what happened to us. So what they're going to say is that the early church was a Protestant church and then it developed them. And so they attacked the uh, organized Catholic church because it has structure, Pope, bishops, priests, all that. So they, they, they're going to kind of have that kind of a, a dialect. Um, so that'll be interesting for us. So anyway, so anyway, uh, rather our qualification comes from God who has indeed qualified us as ministers of a new covenant. Well, this is significant again, is it not? Because the whole of the, of the spirituality, if you go to uh, people who would want to give uh, Bible programs, uh, they will say that the whole of, uh, of religiosity is covenants. And they will list for you the various covenants that build up to the covenants that we have, promises of God to be with us. Not of letter, but of spirit, for the letter brings death, but the spirit gives life. So uh, anyway, Paul is kind of <laughs> knocking his own writings, uh, but he's, he's got the, the truth of it is that the words don't mean much uh, unless they are accompanied by a change in attitude and a change in um, felicity of giving your soul and your body and your work to God. Those are the things that are parts of the covenant. So contrast with the old covenant. Now, and I put in there a little note, Moses himself put on a veil, remember? Why is that? Because his covenant with God was so brilliant that it shone forth. So if he walks down the hill and the people there see him coming down with this glowing figure of a face, you know, almost like a transfiguration. Uh, so he had to put a veil over his face because he was so moved with the, the forces of spirituality. So now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone was so glorious that the Israelites could not look intently at the face of Moses because of his glory that was going to fade. How much more will the ministry of the spirit be glorious? See, so what they're saying is that uh, when, uh, Moses comes down and he's got the, the uh, commandments and things like that. That's all wonderful. They're, they're, nobody's going to talk anything negative about that. However, if you want to have the vivacity of what it is to be a Catholic, a Christian, a follower of Christ, uh, it is precisely that you have changed you, yourself. Uh, you are a different person now. You are a new person. You have been like the baptism and confirmation will say to you, I am a new person. I have been brought into the life of Christ. I live with Christ. Christ lives with me. These are all things that uh, they feel uh, uh, almost um, uh, by nature now is that they are with Christ and Christ is with them. So now we're on uh, right, verse nine. For if the ministry of condemnation was glorious, the ministry of righteousness will abound much more in glory. Condemnation was, you know, to outline all the sinfulness of humankind. Now, verse 10, indeed, what was endowed with glory has come to have no glory in this respect because of the glory that surpasses it. So what they're, uh, again, what they're saying is that if you want to measure out the, the, the uh, advancement of uh, God's way with us, you would say it's based on covenants. What is like the first covenant, uh, Abraham? Well, you go back to Adam and Eve. They had a covenant, didn't they? Yeah, well, they uh, didn't take it too seriously. And um, they were cheated out of uh, the Eden that could have been them. And instead uh, end up with death, with uh, pains at birth, with uh, working for uh, things, a snake on the ground. All those things came about uh, because of Adam and Eve's uh, uh, truncated uh, attitude that we're not going to pay attention to what God tells us because we can do it. Is that not uh, the uh, center of modern day uh, kind of collapse of religiosity? Uh, they're saying now for the first time in the United States, less than half of the people are, are Christian, whereas it used to be a you know, Judeo-Christian country. And why is that? Why are people losing this? Because they don't think that God is important or part of their life or changing up your life because we could do it on our own. <laughs> we are setting ourselves up as the gods. We are in the Garden of Eden and we say, nope, oh, we don't want that tree over there, the tree of life. We want the one that says uh, that you have uh, you know, the power uh, to build your own attitude towards God. So, um, 
For if what was going to fade was glorious, how much more will what endure be glorious? Therefore, since we have such hope, we act very boldly. And not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites could not look intently at the cessation of what was fading. Rather, their thoughts were rendered dull. For to this present day, the same veil remains unlifted when they read the old covenant, because through Christ it is taken away. Well, let's uh, pay attention to that sentence. Because he's talking about the dullness of, of uh, religiosity, of his own uh, patronage, which was Jewish. He was like the second leading Jewish theologian of the time, Paul was. And what he's saying, this is dull. Why is that? Because he constantly in his letters, especially in the Romans, uh, goes after the law. Because what the law does is it organizes your behaviors and your other type things like that. But does it reach to the center of your spirituality? In other words, uh, a Pharisee could rightly say this. I'm to give a donation to the church every week at the, on the Sabbath or afterwards at the temple. I do it twice. I'm supposed to pay a tax on time or by T-H-Y-M-E or some of the other herbs that they have. You're supposed to pay a tax on that. I'll pay twice. Uh, you are supposed to do this kind of recitation of the Psalms. I'll do 10, not five. And uh, so what, what's happening is that the Pharisee lives a religious life uh, and it has these codes and they're, they're very well worked out. There's 613 laws that the Jews uh, have in their, in their list. And, uh, you know, some of them are food things, others are behavior things. Uh, and so with all of that going on, you'd say, well, I've done what I'm supposed to do. So therefore, you know, how about the rich young man when he comes to Jesus? He said, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, well, then you, know, you have to give everything up. He says, not on your life am I going to give everything up. <laughs> why, why is that? Is it bad? No, it's just that that's how he lives. So he, he hasn't done anything wrong. The, the Pharisees and Sadducees, gave themselves this like a mindset we have done nothing wrong however we do not allow anybody out there to pollute us oh did you ever think of trying to convert someone to who you are to bring you back in and forgive how about the prodigal son parable uh, these are the type of things that happen that you know that the, who is the older son the pharisee who says i, I we can't bring you back in and forgive you because you have violated our code, the law. And so uh, this um, is, is kind of like the, what Paul is talking about. He says what we have to do is to uh, uh, assure ourselves that what we have is not just the law, but the way the law is interpreted by Jesus. You say, well, where do you go to get that? Well, obviously, you know, we're in Lent, right? <laughs> How about uh, the beginning of Lent? Yes. And what did we hear from? What was the first the Gospels that we hear from? The Sermon on the Mount. You heard it said, but I tell you, you heard it said, but I tell you, you heard it said adultery is bad. I tell you, don't even have lust in your heart. How about uh, the other virtues and things like that? Say, well, I, I didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, but you didn't, did, do you do anything that was holy and right and uh, uh, bringing life to somewhere, someone else? In? So this is what Paul is, is uh, getting at. So when he's talking about the law, he's not saying that, you know, we're violating the law as much as he's saying we're uh, violating uh, the uh, understanding we have of it. He says, now he says, I'm verse 15. To this day, in fact, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. All of us gazing with unveiled face on the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory as from the Lord who is the spirit. Oh, what I put down there, what a wonderful conclusion. See, I couldn't help but write something there. So I, I have that. All of us gazing are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Uh, I, I find uh, this kind of... Uh, spirituality very important for us during Lent because I know that uh, we uh, have presented to us and all the, the prayers and things like that uh, I give up on some sacrifice and you know uh, we make some fun of that sometimes you know I'm, I'm giving up this this and this oh there it is right there my Dunkin Donuts 
<laughs> so uh, anyway, I yeah I, I have a I have a set regimen of, of what I've uh, arranged for myself, uh, and that, that's important because it means. But uh, at one time, just months ago, I was uh, invited to uh, have one of the Sunday masses in the uh, and, I, and I made this analysis of five things to be a Catholic. I should put that together and bring it to us next time around. We think that what it is to be Catholic is to follow the rules, which means it certainly is that you are moral, uh, that you are faithful, uh, that you are participative, uh, that you are prayerful. These are all things. But I, I think another area that we could explore is not to be saying I'm going to sacrifice this, but I'm going to enhance this. I'm going to bring into my spirituality something of the beauty of life itself. I'm going to go to make a theology, a spirituality of existence. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God is with God in the beginning. All things were made through him. And without him, not a single thing came to be. See, so this is one of the things that we can uh, fasten on. Uh, I, you know, I've been paying attention to some of these programs, these scientific discoveries yeah. and things like that that are coming out now. And they're fabulous uh, kind of understandings, uh, all based on clever work and uh, mindset and uh, the uh, wealth of beauty that is around us. Um, I just give you an example. Everything to me seems beautiful. I, um, you say even the sloppiness of the life and the murders that are going on in the city. I said, uh, you know, the, the difficulty uh, with all of that is that it brings out the sorrow aspect of life, which has its own beauty, which is we cannot exist like this and think that that is our life. Oh, this is a call from Washington, D.C. Sorry about that. Oh, it's a it's a break in Congress. Oh, okay. And, and, and you want to uh, you want to give all all priests in the United States a stipend? <laughs> Sorry. You know, in Germany, they all religious, partly as a response to World War II, all religious institutions do get. Uh, Money from the government. Everybody yes, they're all they're all on, on every 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 denomination that is authentic is uh, on salary. I think it's it's harmful because uh, what it does is it kind of um, makes you a little bit like um, you you would think the positive side is that means you can go out and do your work without worry. Uh, the, the other side of it is well, I'm I'm getting this and and uh, but I didn't get enough. <laughs> Who knows. I've experienced, uh, um, I, yeah, we have, you know, Carmelites in, in uh, Germany, not as many as we'd like. So, uh, the, uh, anyway, uh, let us uh, continue then. Uh, does anybody have any thoughts or uh, reactions to what we've been doing so far? Because this is the end of this particular chapter. Hmm. Yes. 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 Yeah, I'll do that for next week. Yeah. It, uh, is it what it is? It's, uh, you know, it's, instead of uh, thinking alone of sacrificing something that's good, uh, is going after something that expands our soul and our heart even wider than it is right now. In other words, that, 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 that could be an aspect. Of, of what Lent is. I mean, when Jesus goes out into the desert, he goes out there to give up stuff, does he not? He gives up bread, okay? And the devil catches him on that and says, you know, you need some bread. Jesus says, forget about that. Then you go to the ministry of Jesus and he doesn't take bread. He gives bread. First to 5,000 Jewish people, let's say 5,000 Jewish families. Because they, when they say the number 5,000, of course, this is a Jewish number. And, and they're fam families, and most likely they're on the way to this Passover. 
And then he goes over to the Gentile area, Decapolis, and it's 4,000 families. So if, that'd be like 16,000 people. So when the devil comes up and says, uh, I, do you want some bread? Jesus said, get out of my way. I'm going to you know, have a rainbow of bread coming down to people. And uh, so uh, then he says, uh, I, if you can throw yourself off and the angels will, will save you. I go down into the cross, takes me to the realms of death, into the even to, even into the the uh, awaiting kingdom of people who have not been uh, able to contact God's eternity yet because of the fact that they uh, were before Jesus. So you know, so it, these things that he has, he says, and then I'll give you the all the lands of the world. And what does Jesus say, uh, or what do we say about Jesus? He is the King of the universe. You know, so. So the devil comes out to say a, a negativity, which is, you know, you, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take care yeah. of you and with uh, some, some things here, and that's going to be enough. And Jesus puts all that aside because he's not going to do any of those things. What he's going to do is something that is a billion times as great you know, in the feeding of the people of, of twice. Uh, the only miracle that occurs in all four Gospels is the multiplication of the bread. So let's uh, turn the page. What is biblical about Mass on Sunday? Hmm. I thought this might be of some interest to us. And uh, let's see what it says. The Bible commands Israel to keep holy the Sabbath day. Sabbath is Saturday, seventh day of the week. Then why we go to church on Sunday? See, the, the originally people did go to mass on Saturday and Sabbath because they were Jewish. And so that, you know, that was drummed into them. And, uh, but why, why would we switch to, it, it's a sim very simple answer. Jesus rose from the dead on, on Sunday. So um, the original command to observe Sabbath basically concerned an abstention from work. And it gives you the demonstration there. Jews began to attend the synagogue services regularly on the Sabbath. Only during the Babylonian exile or shortly afterwards. Why is that? Well, because of the fact that in the Babylonian ex uh, exodus, you know, that they took them all the way up to Babylon, it's 800 or some miles. And they didn't, they didn't make slaves out of them, but they did make workers out of them, you know, and stuff like that. But they were now gone from their homeland. Well, why would they uh, assemble on the Sabbath to pray? Because that was the way that they could hold their community together. We're all in this together. So in order for us to bond together as faithful Jews, uh, we will pay attention to the Sabbath as the day that we will come together <laughs> because it is for us the beginning of a new week. And, or shortly thereafter, the synagogue did not even exist before that time. Well, that is uh, struck me as very interesting. I never came across that before. And I've read several articles <laughs> that they did not have the synagogues as places of worship before the Babylonian captivity. So it meant that, you know, and they, so what uh, years are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the years of King David would have been the year 1000 BC. And uh, they built a temple, uh, but they did not have synagogues because there's only one place where you could worship and that would be the temple in Jerusalem. And that's where the sacrifices took place. That's where people came on three different occasions during the year, people would travel as best they could to get there to be Part of those ceremonies but they're saying here that they didn't, they didn't then go back to their own parish if you want to call it that um so but but the fact that now that they are gathering together in groups they're making us a, a kind of a solidification of their uh, common idea of being a good jew and uh, in jesus day it was common practice for Jews to go to synagogues on saturday to pray jesus himself regularly attended sabbath services as did Paul and other Jewish discipline, disciples of Jesus. However, it seems that soon after Pentecost, Jewish Christians were gathering at places other than the temple and the synagogue, usually in somebody's home, for prayer and breaking of the bread. Now, breaking of the bread is the metaphor for a communion. After they were excluded from the synagogues, Gentile Christians who had no connection with the synagogue also gathered at homes for prayer and the celebration of the Eucharist. 
fairly interesting that Cardinal George attended uh, Sabbath services. Uh, that would be on Friday night or on Saturday. And, uh, and nobody noticed it until one time somebody saw this gentleman and over in the corner and he was reading from the Hebrew, uh, the Psalms and the prayers of the people in the Sabbath service. So he was doing that. Uh, I, I found that, be, you know, that was never advertised because that's not fair. Uh, Cardinal Bernadine uh, had made great friends with the Jewish community in Chicago, and he would go at, attend to some of their rabbi meetings that they would have. So on the night that he died, he took uh, his last thing that he wrote there was, dear fellow, you know, I cannot attend to your services tonight due to my illness or something like that. And then they, then he died. So when you go to the funeral, uh, you would see a procession going in. And in the procession, of course, they would have practically every bishop in the country was there. They, they were packed in like sardines up on the altar. And uh, so anyway, they came in. And but along with them were the Orthodox priests and the Jewish rabbis. The rabbis were there with tears in their eyes because they lost a friend. Others felt sorrowful because they lost a leader and others. So whatever. I didn't want to sit way in the back. They, they have seats for the priests all the way around the corner. They're folding chairs. So I went in with uh, Vice President Gore in with our woman senator from Illinois. Because <laughs> I thought I'd sit with them because I had a ticket. Then I thought, this doesn't look good either. <laughs> Got every priest sitting on a folding chair, and here I am sitting next to the vice president. You know, explaining to him, I says, "Oh, this is what the Catholics do here and stuff." I said, okay. "I says, and there'll be a collection, and I'll I'll take it for you." <laughs> so I said, "I so I got up out of there and I went to the back." Uh, there's still some places in the pews there, but I thought I thought that was a very uh, intriguing that you know the that the uh, commonality of um, prayer. Uh, in the, the Psalms, because, you know, the Psalms are what we pray. Every liturgical event we have, there's some kind of a Psalm. And those are all from the pen and the mindset of the Jewish people. I, I went to practice uh, ceremonies. I, I wanted to go to Yom Kippur. I went to the other ceremonies were just freebies. You know, you walk in and nobody knows you. Um, but they told me, he said, uh, well, you got to go around the back and get a ticket. I think it was 50 bucks to go into the Yom Kippur ceremony. So it'd be like us if we charged 50 bucks for Good Friday or something. So let's uh, continue. Most likely they uh, continue this practice after they excluded from the synagogues. Gentile Christians had no connection already. In Paul's day, the breaking of the bread and other Christian rituals were done on Sunday rather than Saturday. In 1 Corinthians, Paul specifically mentions that the collection should take place on the first day of the week, Sunday, the day on which Jesus rose from the dead, and the day when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples soon became known as the Lord's Day. In the Bible, this term appears only in the Revelation, the book of chapter 1, verse 10. But it's used often in early post-apostolic literature, for example, uh, the Didache. Uh, let me comment on that, but I'll, I'll finish the sentence here. Assemble on the Lord's Day and break bread and offer the Eucharist. Now, when they talk about the Didache here, you see what they say, the first century C, you know, C means, you know, the common era, uh, and uh, they replaced BC and AD and all that. Um, so anyway, uh, the Didache is a book that lists the liturgical prayers uh, that were developing, that were going to be ritual. By that, I mean, it's not just that you come into the Eucharist, I can imagine in the beginning that something like this would happen. I'm just using my imagination that you would come into uh, a place, maybe with 10 or 15 families in somebody's home and you would have a feast. And that's where Paul gets upset because some people get, you know, got, you know, more expensive stuff and other people got less. But if that wasn't a problem, at least what they're doing then is that someone would get up and say, I would like to talk 
about the way that Jesus responded to uh, the man who was uh, beaten up uh, in, on the road down to Jericho and then was treated by the Samaritan. So they would talk about that for a while. And then, th then they might pray a psalm, but that would be foreign to the Gentiles. Uh, and then they would have the breaking of the bread. Now in the breaking of the bread, they would have a similar thing to what we have, but these things develop uh, rather quickly uh, because what they, ha they would have a preface. In other words, that is, let us now get ready for the celebration of the breaking of the bread. And then they would go to Luke's gospel, which hadn't come across yet. Luke's was written in 85. And in and, and, and Luke's gospel, it said, do this in memory of me. And he, he went through the prayer of the, of the uh, Eucharistic consecration. So that became common then in Matthew, Mark, and Luke have the, con have the consecration. But those books didn't come out till uh, 80, 85, and, uh, 70, 80, and 85. Mark 70, and then uh, Matthew, and then Luke. So uh, anyway, the Didache is aware. So when we have our, we have uh, four Eucharistic prayers. So the one that we use most of the time, especially in the daily masses is, uh, that we had today is the second one. Because the first one is very lengthy and the last one is very lengthy. And so the second and third ones, the second one is uh, you know quite brief. And then the third one is uh, for family and the spirit. So let's continue. The letter of Barnabas uses another term that also refers to Sunday. See, now that, that um, Barnabas letter comes out around 100, as did another famous letter by Clement the first. And, and so to we to rejoice in celebrating the eighth day because that is when Jesus rose from the dead. Now, this is interesting to, uh, that the early church saw the number eight as a icon. So, uh, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm taking up a time, but uh, I find these things interesting. So there is a church that is built in the year 350 or so of the St. Peter's mother-in-law's house, or I should say collection of houses. And they took that area there and they made a church out of it. Because uh, in 325, you, uh, uh, you had, uh, 313, I'm sorry, you had the uh, Edict of Milan, which says that the Christians now could come out in the open and do their prayers openly. And so there's churches being built all over the place. And so, uh, but anyway, they build a, a place here. And what do they do? You say, well, a church should be a rectangle, should it not? No, what they did, it should be an octagon. So the original church that they had for this area of where Peter's mother-in-law's house was, they were row houses. So they were just built one right next to each other. You can see them now because what they have done is they have gone above them and put a, a not a glass, but some kind of a, of a see-through shield. And so you can walk up onto like this, what would be like the third floor. And you could look down and you could see the, all this whole thing right, right there below you because they don't want people walking through and kicking stones and stuff like that. So, uh, but anyway, they made an octagon. So the octagon became a uh, ritual number for eternity. So, no, I, I, <clears throat> I only mention this because of my massive uh, ego. <clears throat> and that is that I have a license plate, uh, 387. So, and you say, well, big deal. Uh, well, seven is the creation of the world. I'm deeply spiritual. Seven is the creation of the world. Three is the resurrection from the tomb. At eight, eight is turned on its side, eternity. So you've got the three elements of the creations. You know, you, you don't, I, so anyway, I just mentioned that. You say, well, yeah, we, we know you're so egotistical beyond belief. Let's um, let's continue. Earliest Christians had no difficulty with words. You on Sunday. Let's uh, in, notice all the quotes that they have here. It says <clears throat> uh, John Revelation and authority that could even counter sacred scripture. Jesus handed on this authority to his church. You could think that when the Gospels came out, that's the first thing they want to have. There is uh, the liturgy of the word. Why why do we have the Last Supper? I mean, that is the central part to it. The the uh, the table. The, uh, the altar, the uh, consecration of bread and wine is the, like the whole of Catholicism. 
you could not have Catholicism without being in Christ and Christ being in us. You just couldn't do it. We would be a Christian perhaps, but you would not be a Catholic because uh, that is for us uh, in one of the great uh, elements of attending to heavenly food as opposed to just uh, an earthly food. I, I gave a, I was asked to uh, preach at a Lutheran church and I, I'm certainly not saying any of these things in, in terms of negativity. And um, so they had two ceremonies. One was a ceremony of the word and the other was a ceremony of, of the breaking of the bread. So I went to the, uh, in the morning and I, the people were there. This is in Beverly in Chicago. And uh, I gave a homily and they uh, all liked it. And so on the way out the door, I says, oh, pastor, that was very nice, you know, because they didn't have anything else. So that's, you know, that was very nice. So uh, then uh, I, I went to the uh, Eucharistic part uh, later, and on the way out the door, they said, well, pastor, nice to have you here. Not a single word about anything else. <laughs> Why? Because they were there for the Eucharist. Now, the Eucharist for them was this. It was a great big, large, large loaf, like like this size, you know, and uh, it, there was a woman priest, and um, her husband actually was a theological uh, professor at, at um, University of Chicago. So uh, anyway, and she would break off a piece of the bread and give it to you because that is where Jesus was. Jesus was in the breaking of the bread. So in other words, the one loaf was now is distributed as a metaphor for Jesus is, is given to the population of the congregation. So that now, now that you have received, you know, the, the bread of the Lord. So that, that was their thing. I, I, and I'm not being impertinent when I say this. I just was curious. I said, because they, they finished off about maybe half of the large loaf. And uh, so I was wondering what they were going to do, you know, with such a thing. And uh, I said, what are you going to do? And they said, well, we're having it for dinner tonight. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> That's why she gave small portions, I guess. I know. I'm just kidding. She, she was a lovely lady, but um, yeah, I, I had the same experience in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, a bishop had been, uh, an Anglican bishop had been, uh, or Episcopalian, yes, had been, had been uh, targeted for death. So the, the, the car came up, take him and his family out to some forest and they were going to shoot him. Well, he ran away and he knew he wouldn't shoot the family because they were kids. And so he ran away and he ran through a river and he got to the other side, eventually came back to Washington, D.C. And he was going to give a talk at a mass quote unquote mass uh, in the basement of the national sh uh, the shrine of the Protestants of, you know, the church that they have there. Uh, and uh, so yeah, he was there and he talked to and he told us about his experience, stuff like that. And then he consecrated the bread, consecrated the wine. But I saw how they did the wine was they had a shelf in the back and they had these large bottles. And so they came out and they poured it, you know, in the various places. And you had a little cup and you had, so anyway, then, then what they did was they took the, the wine that was not used uh, for the communion, they put it back into the large, you know, gallon uh, glass thing and put it back over into the closet. So it wasn't like a, a um, sense, you know, that this Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ. It is a metaphor for being with Christ. So let's uh, continue. Um, the author of the letter of Colossians, I'm, I'm that's kind of at the lower level here. The author of the letter to the Colossians, whether Paul himself or his disciple, hint that the death and resurrection of Jesus had modified the biblical command to keep the holy the Sabbath day. Let no one then pass judgment on you in matters of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. So within a few years of Jesus' death, Christians no longer felt obligated to follow all the Jewish dietary laws, substituted baptism for circumcision, and adopted Sunday as their day of common worship. Okay. I thought that might be helpful for us. Uh, now let's go to chapter four. And you can see that there are uh, two sections here. One is integrity in the ministry. The other is the paradox of the ministry. Therefore, since we have this ministry through the mercy shown us, we are not discouraged. Well, you like to hear that from Paul because of the fact that he said, you know, that he is in this ministry and he says, oh, what a pain this is. I'm every place I go, they try to kill me. They try to, you know, work me down. They try to uh, take all of us. He said, uh, imagine uh, if we can, it would take too long to describe who Paul is. 
uh, because of the fact that we know his brilliance uh, intellectually because of, of his position uh, among the rabbis. And uh, then you have uh, the Paul who has been humbled and never again seems to come back to any kind of egotism or self-orientation. Everything that he does is a pronouncement from God through him. He is an instrument. Uh, he is not the, the music itself. He is the instrument by which God speaks. God needs to do that. And so what Paul is, uh, then he's going to speak. Now, there are some letters about Paul in the 200s or so. Some of them say things like, you know, that he was short in stature, uh, that, uh, you know, he, so he's not a, you know, football player or anything. And and, and uh, he might have even spoken with a, some a t a lilt to it. And uh, and he, uh, he himself indicated that he had something that affected him and that he could not get rid of. And uh, he said he tried three times. He asked God to get rid of this. Now, some people say, oh, well, it could have been epilepsy, could have been some other disease, could have been his, um, you know, um, temptations uh, to give up his faith or something like that. But it, it didn't work. So anyway, but, uh, but imagine then uh, every place that Paul goes, he is under uh, the congratulations by the people that have already kind of heard of him and want to be with him. And then the condemnation that he gets from all the rest. Every place he goes, he seems to, when he was on his first missionary journey, they beat him within a lick of his, of, of his life. Uh, what, what about the other times when he's in Corinth, uh, he goes before the consul there uh, who comes out and makes a judgment, says, I'm not going to get involved in the Jewish thing, so you Jews take care of him. So they took him out and beat him. You know, that was the common punishment was to take him to whip somebody. Uh, what you do is you take a, a long stick of wood and you had two or three great big thongs of leather coming out, sometimes with a ball at the end to give it some weight. And you and would hit the person so that that would teach you, you know, to come back in here and be talking about all this uh, Jesus stuff. So uh, every place he went, it seemed like he had that kind of attention. And then uh, he also then knows that he has a responsibility for uh, to be the evangelical person that he is. Others can do it, but he is, knows that he is the one to do it. He is the great figure of the of the early church in terms of you know, bringing about an understanding of who Jesus is. I mean, we're not denying Peter or anybody else. They all had their uh, you know understanding of this, but he was the one who did this and, and had two books written about. In fact, a good portion of the of the Bible, if you take the the New Testament, a good portion of that is written by Paul, so uh, or about Paul. So what what you have then is. Uh, how does he go to sleep at night? Well, I, I would think he'd just collapse. But what if he was tortured and stuff and he, he didn't know if in the middle of the night there's going to be something or in the morning, what's going to happen the next day? Or did the people that, uh, you know, I, I'm speaking to, uh, there are they uh, leaving the church? Uh, you know, all these kind of internal pressures on his soul uh, had to be immense uh, to the, the point where uh, just to get a psychological, spiritual balance in your life is incredible. Uh, and But he does it. So let's uh, continue here. We are not discouraged. Rather, we have renounced shameful hidden things, not acting deceitfully or falsifying the word of God, but by the open declaration of the truth, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. This is a heavy thinker. Look at that. He says we are uh, he, uh, uh, is very, very strong because there are people, I'm telling you, there are people who are acting deceitfully or falsifying the word of God. And uh, there are people out there that are preaching a different thing. In fact, in the early church, there, uh, um, uh, a segment of the early church along the coast of Africa and stuff like that, maybe, maybe uh, 25, 33% of the early church was heretic. That didn't mean that they weren't you know, uh, opposing Jesus or anything like that, but they had their understanding that Jesus was a man among us uh, and uh, had different ways to express that as opposed to being the child of God. Uh, through Mary. And so, um, uh, any, and Paul's got to put up with that. He says, uh, it says, even though our gospel is veiled, it is veiled for those who are perishing. See, I, I put down that needs some explanation there. In whose case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. Who is the God of this age? Well, there are about a hundred gods that the Romans had. And then there are other groups Zoroastrian and the others that uh, you know that are groups as well. Even the Samaritans would be considered, and so uh, th these are uh, the mind of the unbelievers in anything 
so that they may not see the light of the gospel or the of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for the sake of Jesus. See, uh, Diocletian at one time uh, made himself a god, and in doing so, in the year 350 or so, uh, went into a haywire go went haywire going. Uh, uh, I should say 250, uh, 257 or so went into uh, a, a, a slaughter of Christians. There were two great periods when the when the, the Christians were under severe uh, punishment, and it's all because of this material here. See, is that that we have the minds of the unbelievers because they make their own person of God. And so verse six, for God who said, oh, excuse me, five, we are uh, ourselves, your slaves for the sake of Jesus. For God, about 40% of the Mediterranean area was a uh, slave. Slave could be anything from a teacher to a worker to a guard to uh, uh, working in the mines. Let the light shine out of darkness. Well, that's in John chapter eight. What does Jesus say? I am the light of the world. Remember those I am statements he has? I am the bread of life. I am the vine and the branches. I am the good shepherd. So he says, I am the light of the world. See? So um, and, and a, a biblical person would say, oh my goodness. He is the one who is, the father is the creation and Jesus is the expression of the creation, the light of the world. And so uh, uh, he says, as shown in our hearts to bring the knowledge of the glory of God on the face of Jesus Christ. Let light shade out of the darkness. It's shown in our hearts to bring to light the knowledge of the glory of God on the face of Jesus Christ. Hmm. I put that in there. Abraham Lincoln read this. Abraham Lincoln had two great sources. You know, he didn't have any education whatsoever. Uh, that, that image they have of him where they turned over shovel at writing with charcoal on the back of it. As, as a way to get his words straight. And they say that he had two sources. One was uh, Shakespeare and the other was the Bible. And you can be sure that the Bible was the thing that was helping him to uh, release the slaves. But we hold this treasure in earthen vessels that the surpassing power may be of God and not from us. See the treasure. See, I put in there the power from God, this treasure in earthen vessels. This, I think, is one of Paul's greatest lines. I think I might have told you this, that when I was in college, they had a uh, session there. They brought in people from the parish, and uh, each of us each week would have to get up and give some kind of a talk. So it was my turn, and so I gave a talk. And so I chose this passage. I say, well, I says, why do you, why, why would you say that I, I would say I'm an earthen vessel? <clears throat> well, because I looked in the mirror. So take it from there. Now, uh, what I, I, I uh, put in here, a masterpiece of irony. See, I, irony is that he should have been collapsed. Yeah. But listen to this. We are afflicted in every way, but not constrained perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. See, each one of these things would have put him in a box or in the hole uh, or just thrown it out in the place for the wolves. Always caring about in the body, the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our body. What does he mean by this? The dying of Jesus. See, the cross becomes the central image of Christianity. Now, they had a trouble with that in the beginning because the cross was a sign for all legal people of a degradation of humanity. In other words, this is a person who deserves to be beaten to death. And so what um, the dying of Jesus, yeah, it has to be, the extension, and of course, you've heard this over and over again, of the verticality of Jesus. You know, certainly, you know, the, all things were made through him. But through the cross, his arms are outstretched as an embrace to the world. And so uh, the, the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. So I, I'm going to interpret that dying of Jesus not as a, 
a death, although that is a conclusion that when we die, we die with Jesus, you know, because he has resurrected us. But I also am taking that in the mystical sense of saying that the dying of Jesus is exactly what he did in his life. He came into this life to go through death to life. Adam and Eve had brought about, you know, death as a, a consequence of their sin. You recall that we have talked about uh, in uh, Jerusalem or in other places when they have either pictures, paintings, or even a representation of a cross, uh, and they would have at the bottom a skull. And that skull would be the skull of Adam, not the real skull who was around at that time, you know. So, uh, uh, but the skull. And, and so what, what it is, it's a reminder what Jesus is the new Adam. Just as Eve was the mother of humankind, so Mary was the mother of all spiritual kind, you know, of the spirituality of people. She is the new Eve. So Jesus is the new Adam. The old Adam was a failure. This Adam is the completion. And so that's what he's talking about in uh, giving up of dying of Jesus is he came into the world to do this so that we might have life. For we who live are constantly being given up to death for the sake of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. See, so what, what he's talking about is that uh, I put down there a mystical phrase because it's being given up in death, which is something we can see and, and understand. So the life of Jesus may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. See what Paul is doing is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, working to the point of death so that you might live. I think that he's making an identification with his suffering being what Jesus suffered. What does Jesus say in the Gospel of Luke? Father, they know not what they do. See? So he's got, look at this, all this. We're afflicted. We're perplexed. We're persecuted. Driven to despair. Struck down. Destroyed. All these things. But none of those is affecting him. Uh, even though he's an earthen vessel, it's not affecting him. It's not changing his, it's, he's not even, seems, doesn't even seem to be like a fear. It just seems to be a reality. This is the way it's going to be. Why? Well, because I'm with Christ and he's with me. Since then, we have the same spirit of faith. According to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We too believe and there, therefore spoke. See, what, what do we say at the end of Mass? Ite missa est. See, get out of here. <laughs> One of the great bishops of our country was a bishop up in the Chicago Diocese, Bishop Kakanis. And he was the bishop out in Tucson. I went out to help our school out there, and which I did for a year and a half, got them on the right track. And uh, anyway, uh, at the graduation ceremony, he was going to have the ceremony and the nuke, they re refurbished the cathedral out there, went back to the 1700s. And so, uh, so anyway, he's saying at the mass, so the students all come in, you know, they're all got their caps and gowns, moms and dads are there. The principal, you know, was there, I, you know, I was the president or whatever I was, I don't you know. So anyway, I got a good parking spot. So anyway, uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I'm there. So we're all just kind of happy. And so he he comes down, leaves the microphone, and comes down. And he says, get out of here. <laughs> They're all like, what did we do? Is this somebody, you know, break or pew or something like that? Get out of here. Get out of here. He says, you don't belong here. He says, because we always say at the other man's eat tame as I asked, it's over. So get out of here and go do your life. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You mean we still are going to graduate? <laughs> he was a very effective uh, speaker. He's just a profound speaker. And, uh, but anyway, people loved him for that. Uh, we, we had been great friends for uh, 20 years before that. Knowing that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and place us with you in his presence. You see what all of this is doing? I mean, what it says here, the paradox of ministry. On the one hand, the paradox is, we are saving the world. The other one is, does it hurt? Mm -hmm. Everything is for you. So grace can be bestowed in abundance and more and more people may cause this thanksgiving to overflow for the glory of God. Therefore, we're not discouraged. Rather, although our self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. When he says our, our outer self is wasting away, you can figure, well, yeah, what kind of food are they getting? You know, so anyway, 
for this momentary light affliction is producing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to what is seen, but to what is unseen, for what is transitory, but what is unseen is eternal. Well, I'm just telling you, this is all poetry, is it not? Aren't these beautiful expressions? Uh, he is not, he's not laying down the law for us. He's not uh, you know, hightailing it, you know, telling us what we're doing wrong. Instead, what he's doing is telling us, here's the reality and we're putting up with it. Why? Because we live in Christ and Christ lives in us. And that gives us the strength to do these things. Uh, how would you like to be listening to Paul to one of these great uh, statements? Uh, I he, he practically would fall over saying, oh my God, he's, he's just courage personified. Uh, spirituality personified. There's nothing that that seems to uh, you know bring him down to absolute dissolution. He doesn't say, I, "I've had enough. I've had enough. I'm out of here. You guys take over." No, no. Yeah, he continues to be the great leader uh, all the way, all the way. So, well, that uh, concludes our uh, reflections for today. So. Uh, Next week, we uh, move on. Today was three and four. Next week, we're going to do five and six. Now, I did mention to you, uh, you know, on, on the outline that I gave you of our, of our program, that we would have the possibility of something uh, during Holy Week. I have um, developed a sense of the architectonic structure of the Gospel of John in its entirety. Then I have a selection of that same architecture for five different scenes in the passion of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Now, to say it's a passion is unfair because the word of the chapter 13 to 21 is the book of glory. Uh, chapter 13, verse one says this, Jesus knew that the hour had come to leave this world and to go to the Father. And so he loved his own to the fullest. They, they translate that as a, the word is telos in Greek, which means to the fullest means which to completion. So people think, well, that means till he leaves us. No, no, no. The telos means exactly, he says, and I will love them to the fullest. In other words, he's going to love us all the way through heaven and our eternity. Oh, it's magnificent. So, so anyway, uh, and and uh, we do have Good Friday service here, you know, and, and we read the Gospel of John. So if you wanted to think about uh, that is one of our possibilities. I will. So, obviously, it's not a requirement, but there will be no refund. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for your kind attention. Now, let me repeat that. Uh, please take a magazine. Thank you again for watching us. See you next week. <laughs>